Okay, let me just finish off my drink. Mm. It's delicious. It's so good, but this is terrible. I've got gas now, and I'm just totally going to just belch during the podcast. I know I it. I mean, that's what that's what soda pops do. <laughs> is there anything worse than that on a podcast? Maybe eating popcorn would be worse. Oh, no, there are, there are plenty. No, popcorn definitely is not the worst. It's like slurping would be worse. Like, <laughs> like, slur- like slurping soup. Like, no, no, just like plain broth. That would that would be the worst. Yeah, just that'd like be pretty bad. No, that'd be disgusting. <laughs> all right, well, let's get to it, shall we? <clears throat> let's get to all of it. All right, welcome everyone to episode number twenty-three of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet, and I'm Drew Brown, and we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver our casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous. Fountain Pen Show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our Fountain Pen Lives. Today, we are going to be talking about, fr- no, let's see here, penabling, also penabling lefty pen friends, a couple of penabling questions, and we've got a couple of the random questions, and then we have this lightning round of a bunch of silly questions. This was based on ones that Drew pulled, so we're going to see where this thing goes. Drew, I opted today for no gel in the hair, because I had this weird like wavy cowlick thing going on here and i just kind of wanted to see where it would go there and, you go uh, go ta- with the wave it's taking me on an adventure right now i don't really know what it's doing but didn't want to hold it back so there we go yeah there you go <laughs> go with the wave embrace the flow that's right and drew your shirt makes me think of summer but i was feeling in a fall mood so i've got the the flannel blue Fair enough. Of well co- blue of course <laughs> funny you mentioned this shirt brian this is kind of a big deal today because why, Ooh, why? why this is, is this is this is the last of my wild button ups for uh before i start repeating them oh my gosh wow i have worn it i have worn a different one for all 23 pen casts wow thus far <laughs> i have worn some assortment of shirts i don't know i don't keep track <laughs> <laughs> well i just like i just started moving them to like the left of like where my pants are so i know kind of what I've worn, so I'm like, hmm. so I was like, okay, when when I wear it on a pen cast, I kind of move it to the other side. Hmm. So I've just been going back to that well. But on the plus side, Brian, of hmm. course, I don't care about repeating, but I can, I think, maybe transition to the holiday sweaters here shortly. Ooh, you know, you and I both have a decent sweater collection. So yes, and I, I also have a good amount that like aren't specifically holiday themed, just kind of like wintry Nordic ones. So I, I think I can start breaking those out now. Okay. All right. Maybe we'll look yeah. for, we'll look forward to that next Bencast. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see indeed. It, do, it does get kind of hot sitting in here for yeah. a, a couple, like for two hours in the afternoon. Yeah, We've got like, a lot of windows in here. It's, and like pushing we'll seven, it's like pushing 70 degrees as we're recording right yeah, now. Yeah, not so. today. Not today. Not quite there. Maybe, maybe after Thanksgiving. We'll see. Um, yeah, we'll see. All right, um, let's start off with the first segment then. Feedback. Drew, you found some good feedback this week. Yeah, we've got a lot of good feedback this <laughs> week, Brian. Um, kicking things off, Ephraim, uh, who also made a comment about how he is not uh, Team Drew in terms of keeping three pens inked up. He's Team Brian, so That's I don't right. know how I feel about Ephraim, but, uh, you know, either way, we're going to read uh, his comment. And he says, I have to say that I usually don't watch videos about fountain pens if they're not related to art. Most of my fountain Mm. pens are very utilitarian or art friendly, and I'm not into expensive fancy pens, but I never missed any of your videos, and you guys are part of my Saturday morning routine, getting ready to go to my local school to teach art. You guys make our fountain pen community a fun experience. Please don't change and keep up. Okay, I guess he's on my cool list again. Thank you so much. That was really awesome. That's pretty glowing review, I gotta say. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Thank I, you for that. I always love um, that. I always love that. I'll interject here in a second. That was one of the coolest things about doing the Q&A for as long as we did is people would talk about how like literally it was part of their weekly routine. And there's a little bit of pressure that can come with that, which is like, oh my gosh, if we don't do one this week, it's going to like screw up everybody's routine. Like they're not going to, they're not going to want to do their dishes or, you know, <laughs> prepare for their art class or whatever. And it's like, okay, no, it's not that important. Like people will be fine. Um, but right. Yeah, we've got a good rhythm going here with the pen cast. We'll see if we can keep it up. Very cool. And then Dave, another really, really nice comment says, thanks guys. You two are so entertaining. It was a difficult week this past week. I had a defibrillator implanted in me and sitting down for an enjoyable hour of Goulet pen cast felt like catching up with a couple of friends. If I had to ask, is there a pen whose size works well with bad hands or fingers? It seems if I'm moving into that stage of life. Wishing you all a good week and prayers for dealing with this crazy world. Thanks again. Uh, first of all, Dave, 
thank you so much. I hope you have a speedy recovery. I think I hope that things go as well as can be expected for you for here on out. In regards to the pen, we actually have a slice on good pens for uh, arthritic hands. So I will link that in the description and you can check that out. We covered that on an earlier mm-hmm. podcast, but thank you so much. And we really, really yeah. do. We're, it's honor. It's our honor to you know be that for you, especially yeah. now. To summarize, it's like really large pens that are lightweight tend to be the best. Yep. Very cool. Um, and finally, this is my favorite this week, Brian. Luke posted not on this video or our last pencast video but we um actually no our last pencast video we mentioned a comment uh where someone was complaining about uh, our facial expressions in the best browns uh slice that i took from an earlier q a where i talked about best my favorite brown pens and inks and someone just said too much facial expressions and brian and i didn't know who they were talking about um we assumed brian it was true sus- because brian he- suspected it was me in fact i believe he said have you seen your face so, ha ha, Mr. Goulet, guess what Luke did, Brian? Luke found out that it was probably Mr. Goulet making the faces, and he says, to prove it, here's 44 glorious seconds of nothing but Brian's reactions to Drew's picks. So, I am going to link that so that you can view that. Uh, Brian, what, what is your opinion? Do you want to check this thing out, or have you already? I have not checked this thing out yet. So I guess we got, I can kind of scrub through. It's 44 seconds, right? So I don't know. We'll see. We can cut out anything that's not relevant. All right. So you want me to pull this thing up and check it out? Yeah, why not? A reaction to my own reaction to your pen list? Is that, is that what we're doing? Is that really? It uh, seems like that's what we're doing, yes. Are we that meta? Okay. All right. Let me type in the URL here. Let's see here. Oh, my gosh. It's got music and everything. It does. Well, the music's really loud in my ears. Okay. <laughs> I love how my R's are darting around everywhere. <laughs> very, very, very expressive. Okay, I don't have to watch the whole thing. I get it. I make a lot of faces. I know. I've been, I've been had. I've been caught. <laughs> it's probably right. What happens is when Drew's talking for a long time, I literally don't know what to do. So I just feel like I have to make dumb faces. It's I've, I've been that way ever since I was a kid. Like if you look at every single picture of me. I'm making a stupid face. It's just I don't know. I don't. This is what I do when I get awkward. Is I make dumb. I make dumb faces. Apparently, I don't really think about it that much. You know, it's like my way of like reacting and like talking to Drew without using words because I don't want to like talk over top of him. So I just like have a very expressive face. I was in show choir when I was in high school too. So the expressive faces, you know, came in handy there. But. Right. You didn't do anything wrong. I think I'm I'm very glad that we we have that, and I'd no. rather you be expressive than not. I mean, we're not like doing anything else. There's no, I have no, I don't even have a background. It's just like my <laughs> painted wall. I feel like I have to compensate somehow. Otherwise, I'm literally just sitting here staring at the camera with an empty wall behind me. That's why I have like this is a thousand so drinks. Like, this is how I'm gonna act now every time that Drew, no no it's endearing every time Drew talks i'm just gonna like no stare. it's delightful it's delightful and magical don't you change a thing this i'll just pretend like i'm looking at like a magic eye poster <laughs> no just, like, you do you from, man like, you the... do you that's <laughs> phenomenal fair enough but uh but have you even seen your face have you seen your face <laughs> <laughs> i like to give drew zingers i like to give him a hard time when it's not uh, justified at all because it's just funny uh, okay Drew and I have known each other a long time, and we just like to, you know, we equated each other before the pencast started to like uh, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemon, you know, from Grumpy Old Men or The Odd Couple. We learned that they were the original yeah, there we go. Odd Couple movie. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I I I, uh, I trolled you a little bit on this last comment. I'm going to have you read too, so enjoy that one. Great, thanks, Drew. <laughs> you can tell that Drew picks these questions because he kind of sets me up, which is why I got to passive aggressively make jabs at him. <laughs> There's even no if, passive about it. Even, yeah. Active, I got to make active aggressive jabs at Drew. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Pete said, OMG, that is the one ring for the Lamy 2000. I was talking about the little ring when you take the, the grip section off. I lost mine down the Anduin. Anduin? What is that word, Drew? Is that a sink? I don't know what Anduin is. I don't know. Maybe you can look that up real quick as I'm reading the rest of it. Okay. It was the bathroom sink, but still, oh, is Anduin like a Lord of the Rings thing? I don't know. I'm not I'm not a Lord of the Rings fan. Anyway. I, I think he might have just I think he might have just meant to say drain. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, it was the bathroom sink, but still I had to disassemble the hair trap. I think I would rather face the legions of Mordor. Oh, that's gross. But hey, at least you got it back. That's pretty cool. Um, funny. Also, a a Anduin is a World of Warcraft character. So judging oh. by Dave's Lord of the Rings reference, he mm. might have had this Warcraft character in his um, uh, auto uh, pre-filled words. Oh, and it like typed it instead of Drain? Perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah, I get that a lot. It wants to autocorrect my name to Brian. Uh, or, or sorry, from Brian to Brain whenever I'm typing my name. Um, brain Goblet. Brain Goblet or Brain Toilet usually is the autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> toilet is funny. That's more of a Microsoft thing. Um, the, the goblet is a more common one that gets corrected. Anyway, not relevant at all. Okay. I'm glad you found it, Pete. Yep. Got to watch out for those rings. They'll try and get away from you. All right. Got a couple of comments here from Alan. I'm assuming the same Alan, Drew. Um, yeah, this is Alan. Yes. Brian, why are you making me cry over blue on blue on blue cards from the kids? I was talking about how my kids always make me blue cards because they know I love blue. Blue pens, blue ink, blue cards. Yeah. Makes me tear up too. Um, and then Alan also said, I have the lioness and cubs and two children. That's right. Brian has opened my eyes to yet another layer of meaning in the pen, giving my children chances to challenge themselves and fail, but safely because we're watching over them. Brian, I'm crying again. Sorry, Alan. Don't mean to make you cry, but it sounds like it's a good cry. It doesn't sound like it's an ugly cry. It sounds like it's a, you know, single tear, like welling up as you're like you know, swelling can, with pride kind of cry. like that. Kind he of can cry. wipe his tears with all of his Namikis. Yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. They'll hold up well. That Yurushi is uh, pretty durable. All right. Very cool, Alan. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I am honored. Uh, and then the last one we have here that Drew's trolling me on from Energizer Bunny. On Drew's three pen system video, I saw the pencast episode where this was debated... Which one? Because we bring it up basically every time. Um, and decided to give it a try because previously I was using Brian's method. And well, let's say there were a lot of dried out pens and a lot of wasted ink. That is a fact. I don't hide that at all. Uh, I also combined it with having a pen of the day. I'm a student taking notes and found switching pens mid-lecture difficult. With the combination of these two systems, I've almost completely written two piston fillers empty. Previously, I almost couldn't get through a converter without changing or having to clean. This system has been a revelation for my fountain pen use, and it's all thanks to Drew. Well, aren't you feeling pretty good about well, yourself, so, Drew? So nice of you to read that for the yeah. viewing public, Brian. Absolutely. Uh, no, I mean, legitimately, Drew's system is better than mine. Like, there is no, <laughs> there is no dispute about that. I just give him a hard time because I... I don't know. I don't know why I give you a hard time about that. <laughs> I don't it know why a, I'm like this. It is an all-around better system. <laughs> Mine is not even a system. Mine is a complete <laughs> lack of system. And all I do is talk about its shortcomings. Uh, so it is pretty ridiculous for me to try to defend my position. Um, no, it's it's really a better system. I just don't adhere to it in any way whatsoever. Uh, it's a because, complete lack of system? Yeah, I have, I, I, have, I have many lack of systems in my life. Uh, and I stand by them. <laughs> but I shouldn't. <laughs> You were killing me today, dude. I'm on, I'm have, on it today. I, I have many lack of systems in my life. <laughs> these are some good quotes, Drew. I might have to add these to our little quote list. Oh, my goodness. God. Okay. Um, moving on to some new stuff. New stuff that we have. And we have uh, several several new stuff. Um, first one that we have is the Mana Verde Regatta Mother of Pearl. We have it in two different colors. We have a white and a black mother of pearl. I actually have one of each of these because hey. I just absolutely love shiny things. And actually, I have kind of a theme of shiny things in my my, my own personal pen collection today. Um, so white mother of pearl, here you go. Um, these are all strips of mother of pearl. So it's the regatta, which is the one that's all like kind of chunked out like this. Um, and it's full, full abalone, right? Um, well, I guess this is the, the abalone, I guess, I think it's called green abalone technically. Um, and then the white mother of pearl there. So that's te technically the shells you're dealing with. Um, very affordable pens for what they are. Typically to get pens with this much shell inlay in them, you're into like Namiki type territory or like high-end Pelican limited editions. So lately, Monteverde and Conklin have been just absolutely on fire with the shell, which is pretty awesome. And I dig it and I'm getting every single one of them because they're rather affordable. Um, now Drew and I did use the regatta 
It was not like our favorite carry around, use every moment of the day kind of pen. But for me, this pen that's so like ornamental and looks really good would make for a great desk pen. So you don't have to carry it around, but you get to like pull it out. You can take it to a meeting every now and then or on a call, you know, if you're doing the video thing and uh, you get to use a gorgeous looking pen and just have it as kind of like eye candy on your desk. That's to me where this thing just does really well. And because it caps and uncaps so easily, you can just quickly take a note, put it back and then move on and just look at something really pretty. So I'm digging those. We got those online this week. Um, well, we already had the white one, but the black one we got online this week. Uh, we also got in the new Lamy pen, the Ideos. So that is a relatively newer thing, an extra fine through medium. If you haven't heard about that yet, it's palladium finish, $111.20. That is a random number, but that is there. Um, the question I had, Drew, so I've used it a little bit, but I don't have one in my hands right now. Now that teardrop shape that that thing has, that carries all the way through to the grip, right? So yes. I, if they're right-handed... That's probably going to work just fine because it was comfortable for me, but I didn't think about for lefties because that point on the teardrop thing would end up like right where your finger needs to rest. So I'm really curious how that is going to be for left-handed uh, that, pen that's users. That's possible, but in talking with left-handed users over the years, there's not there's certainly not one grip for all left-handed riders. Sure, sure. There's it, it, it really does vary just as much as it does for right-handed mm. riders. There are, there are many left-handed fountain pen users that have an even more traditional grip than a lot of right-handed users do. Hmm. Like I've, I've seen some right-handed riders write with some wacky positions, oh, yeah. like some super like how in the world, like there's no way it could be comfortable looking at it. But then some left-handed riders just write totally normal even under, um, and don't have a problem. So it really does vary. I, th I, I imagine there will be just as many right-handed users that are uncomfortable with this this uh, grip than there are left-handed users. That's a, good, that's a good point. Good point. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious. Curious how that pen is going to be received. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting as it gets out there into the world and we get people's feedback on it. Um, we also got in the Mayora Mitho in steel nib. We alluded to this a couple of weeks ago. We had the gold nib version only previously. People didn't understand that it was the gold nib version. They saw it at a lot of other retailers in both the steel and gold. They thought that we were just like charging more and it was like, no, it's gold nib. That's why it's more. Well, okay, let's carry the steel. So we have that now. Same pen, just steel nib. Um, does not have the piston filler. So I guess I shouldn't say it's the same pen because it's not, but... Um, slightly different pen with a steel nib. So we got that. You can check it out on the site. And then um, the Twisby inks, the 1791s. Have we talked about these, Drew? I can't remember. Because, no. Okay, so these are new on the site. So these are not the original batch of Twisby inks. They, it's a new batch. So the original one was, they were good colors, but just very like, I don't know, I'll call them safe, like very conventional colors. Conventional. No, not, yeah, not safe in terms of like, you know, will it damage your pen? Of course, they're going to be safe in that way. But I meant safe as in like, not like really wild colors, like very conventional colors you would expect from a pen company. These ones are a little, I don't know, a little more jewel tone, a little uh, more saturated, it seems. Uh, and I really kind of like them more. So uh, you've got five colors. You've got uh, tangerine, grape, navy, crimson, and forest green. So go and check those out. If you haven't uh, gotten to test the, uh, the Twisby inks yet, the bottles are really attractive, um, really good performing inks, nothing crazy in terms of properties, uh, but these are a little punchier colors. So if that's more of your thing, I think these ones are worth a look. All right, and that's what I got for my new stuff. Um, Brian, I think that during that time, you might've had a ladybug visitor crawling behind you. Oh, for that real? Is, that, that is now gone, yes. It, oh, I yeah, believe it's, right there. Yep. No, it was a different one. Oh, uh, there's one up there too. That was it. And there's one over there. Yeah, we're gonna talk about <laughs> we're gonna talk about the ladybugs here <laughs> later. I have Stay a lot tuned. Of, I have a lot of ladybug friends visiting me uh, right Stay now. Stay tuned. Um, okay, so first thing I want to talk about is gift sets, Brian. And I'm not talking about stuff that we put together and say, hey, here's a package set. These are legit boxed gift sets that you can buy for friends and family, loved ones for this holiday season that are actually yourself. in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've got a great idea for that, as a matter of fact. Mm. So these are actually in boxes, very nicely presented boxes from both Lamy and Diplomat. With Lamy, you're going to have the option of either an All-Star or a Safari. And then within those options, you have, you know, do I want a bottle? Do I want cartridges? We've got a lot of different variations, mm. a lot of different combos for you. Um, and really, uh, it's going to have something for everybody. The yeah. cool thing about the Diplomat boxes is, A, We've never done it before. So just to 
bare bones this thing. It's going to be the Diplomat Arrow, multiple colors, in a nice little box with some ink, the pen. The kicker, though, is that um, you can, because it is distributed by Yaffa Brands in the USA, you can also get a free bottle of Private Reserve ink from now through uh, the holiday season. So you can buy this gift for your friends because you're that generous of a person, and then you can pocket a nice, you know, ebony purple or something like that uh, mm. from Private Reserve. So it or, is a gift. It's a gift for your kindness. Or you can buy the pen gift set for yourself and give the extra bottle of ink as the gift to the other person if you're, you know, so inclined. I'm just saying you have options. You have options. You have <laughs> options available to you. But the cool thing is that they're very, they're packaged up very nicely, very presentable, yeah. very gifty. Nifty gifties, as That's Michael right. Scott would and, say. And this is a seasonal thing, so we're not going to have this uh, for very long. Once they're gone, they're gone. Um, and these, we've we've been planning for quite a while. The Lamy ones, um, I think it's been mm, close to nine months that we've been planning these because there have been so many shortages. Uh, I'm really glad uh, and grateful for working with Lamy so far in advance because we were disrupted quite a bit. And if had we not ordered them so much in advance, we would have missed the holidays. So it's pretty cool that we have them. It took a lot of extra work, just FYI. Not that you care, but maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure it's appreciated. And then continuing with the holiday theme, Bennu, as they have done in years past, is going to be com coming out with a holiday-themed pen, and it's going to be called the Mistletoe. And this time, it's going to be on their relatively new Talisman model, which is exciting. It's a nice, reddy, whitey, sparkly thing. Of course, it has sparkles. But uh, that should be coming sometime early December, we're hoping. So enough, hopefully in enough time for it to get to where it needs to go. Yeah, it's a good-looking pen. That's a that's a nice one too. It's a larger pen. It's got that number six nib on it. Mm -hmm. It's really good. In the past, they've it's got done some yeah facets. What did, yeah, they did the hexagon. I think was the first one they had. It's called like New Year's. Yeah, the new it was the new the New Year's one. Yeah, and then I can't remember. Did they do one last year? I think they did. Yeah, I can't remember what it was though. My memory is uh, fading. Actually, no, 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 no. This year it's blue and silver and white. Last year it was red and red and white. Oh. Anyway, I'll put an image yeah. up. You'll see it. I thought it was green this year. Oh, gosh. Oh, maybe you're right. I'm glad, I don't we, even know. I'm glad we researched this at all. I, I, I looked did. It up. I looked it up. I just can't remember it. Oh, yeah. Same, same, same here. <laughs> I looked it up. Yeah. What anyway, that's all That's all I have for... Uh, oh, yeah. Soon. It okay. is green and white. Totally. Yep. Totally green and white with some beautiful sparkles. Yeah, it it's is. lovely. Yep. There you go. Yay. Nice. That's, that's the new stuff. Good stuff. All right. Let's uh, transition over into our Q&A segment. We got some fun questions. Drew, you want to kick it off with number one? I certainly do. This question comes to us from Zoheb Manizia, and it is asked of us. Can y'all rank the smoothest writing nibs from highest to lowest? Thanks. Like all of them? Mm-hmm. Every Weirda single one. Like a, like a VH1 top 100 countdown? those like irresistible things that uh yeah. whenever it would come on you'd be like oh well i gotta watch this and you're in for like five hours you know but yeah. now there's youtube yeah. and you can watch like 15 minute compilations of the same thing no i think we can break this one down <laughs> to uh kind of a discussion about yeah you know yeah smoothness in general maybe talk about what nibs kind of are on one more severe end of the spectrum and then maybe the other end of the spectrum yeah well i mean i think we're gonna have to do that because the thing that I both love and hate about this whole fountain pen thing is that uh, there are so many different options and so many different variables. Uh, you know, there are definitely some some brands that you can maybe generalize in terms of writing experience, but a lot of times you're breaking things down into the individual pen model and oftentimes individual nib size within a given model to talk about its specific qualities, such as smoothness of writing. Um, even within one pen model, you can have a widely varying experience of smoothness based purely just on the nib size. Um, so I think it can be a pretty safe generalization across all brands that if you have one pen model, the broader nibs are generally going to be a lot smoother because you have a larger surface area that's contacting the paper. The finer nibs are almost always going to be a less smooth writing experience because it's a finer point that is making contact with the paper. It's gonna have more, more of a grip, more traction, that kind of thing. So 
Um, I think that that's a pretty safe generalization to make. Um, I think, you know, generally speaking, a lot of gold nibs can tend to be a little smoother, but that gets really muddy. And so um, I think when you're getting into, especially European gold nibs, um, I'm thinking specifically of like Pelican and Lamy, their gold nibs tend to be really, really smooth. Um, especially as you get up into like the Souverons and stuff like that, the M800, M1000s, the M600 actually, that's one of Rachel's favorite is like the Pelican M600 Broad. Boy, that's so smooth. And you get into like the medium and broad Lamy 14K nibs, they get so smooth. And so um, those are those are good ones. I think Pilot makes some really, really good smooth nibs, especially the gold nibs as you get up into the, the broader nib sizes um, as well. They've got a little bit of bounce to them, a little bit more like um, kind of a softness that you would expect on a Pelican nib. Um, but then, you know, if you go on the other end of the spectrum, the ones that are less smooth, I think you're looking at flex nibs in general because you have you know, tines that are spreading apart, you're, you're essentially splitting the, the, the surface contact in two, and then you're, you know, dragging, especially if you drag it to the side with any writing pressure, it's just going to not feel great. Um, so unless you practice a lot with a, with a flex nib, it's going to feel pretty rough, uh, as you start, especially if you're using something like a steel nib that doesn't have as much natural bounce to it anyway, something in like specifically a noodler's flex nib, um, those are going to maybe feel a little bit rougher on you. Um, I think some of the Japanese extra fines and fines because they grind those a little finer than some of the European nibs. Um, so you're going to have, again, kind of fitting into the whole thing about the the nib size in general. You know, that's going to those are going to tend to be a little bit on the uh, the more toothy end of the spectrum. Uh, and that's that's kind of the generalization that I have there, Drew. You got some stuff to add to that? Yeah, I would agree with that. And this is one of those times where rather than answering the question very definitively, I'm going to be with Brian and say that this definitely <laughs> needs to be skirted a little bit. Um, if I were to, you know, list some of my top brands of, you know, like this brand has the smoothest nibs, like Brian said, within that brand, like Lamy, for example, the smoothest nib I've ever written with was a Lamy 2000 medium or broad, like mm -hmm. those are just butter. But then also within that's a completely different nib than they have on all of their other pens. So mm -hmm. you can't really say that Lamy has smoother nibs than Visconti because it's just apples and oranges. So, and then if I made like a top five nibs that are the smoothest in my life, they're all going to be mediums and broads, and that's not going to be informative at all. So, yeah, that's a difficult question to ask. But I will mm -hmm. say that smooth doesn't necessarily mean better. Smooth is not the end all be all of what you're trying to get out of a nib. You want balance balance and you want it to be smooth but then you also need it to be able to deposit ink onto the page and if it is over smoothed it cannot do that mm. so there are some nibs specifically uh i can think of like sailor and aurora who don't try to go all the way into smooth as silk territory so mm -hmm. that you can have a more consistent, more reliable writing experience. And sure, they could try to smooth it and try to like, you know, get, you know, dial it in perfectly, but they don't do that. They, they're like, you know, let's just do what we need to do to make it so it's not scratchy by any means, but mm -hmm. it's going to, it's going to grip enough to put the ink down. So, yeah. um, th those come to mind as unique examples of, uh, fountain pen companies who produce their nibs with a specific, you know, uh, coarseness to them so that it's more of a uh, tactile, haptic sort of uh, experience for you writing-wise. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, I would also just add that uh, what Brian said about German nibs, you know, especially the larger nibs being, you know, extra, extra smooth. And a lot of that, mm -hmm. well, not a lot of it, but a portion of that also has to do with the fact that broad nibs are going to put down a little bit more ink so you're going to have that um i don't know what you would call that brian the 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 act of it being smoother because there's more ink being put down some sort of uh, hydroplane like, hydroplaning effect i don't know lubrication or something yeah, yeah. but it, it's going to feel it's going to feel a little bit different because you're yeah. writing on more of a wetness yeah I, that makes sense um and if you think about it too you know in, in general when you're talking about pens that are made in, you know, call it more the Western nibs, right? So things made in, 
you know, Germany, France, Italy, uh, most of that script is longhand. You're writing longer letters, more flowy. So smoothness matters because you are you're keeping your pen on the paper for a longer period of time. That is a good point, Brian. Yeah, generally speaking, Asian writing, uh, especially with you know more characters, um, is uh, much more short strokes uh, that make up symbols. And so, um, having you're not writing like long, flowy stuff. So, um, precision and uh, having fine nibs and having um, what's it called? Like uh, um, um, I was going to say like reactivity, but that's not really the word I'm going for. You know, having something that's like very responsive, a very responsive ah. nib, that's going to matter more for that style of writing. So it's not that necessarily one is good, bad, wrong, right, the other. You know, it's that it really, again, because fountain pens are so personal, how you write with it can um, can vary quite a bit. And it's difficult, unless we were to take a very scientific approach and say, we used this machine to measure the smoothness at this angle and this writing speed on this paper, da 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 we can't say definitively this nib is smoother than this one because there are a lot of different variables, even just in terms of the writing angle that you use, you know, that can change the smoothness that you feel even on the exact same pen. So a lot of variables, but it just keeps it interesting. It keeps it fun. And that's why everybody has a different opinion about which nibs are the best. So you get to try a bunch and learn which ones are your favorite. But, you know, me personally, I appreciate, I appreciate all different kinds. You know, if I'm going to grab something like a Sailor or an Aurora, you know, I know I'm not going to have the like slipping on the ice rink with buttery socks on, um, you know, kind of, <laughs> I couldn't remember. There was like a hot, hot butter, cutting a hot knife through butter on ice or whatever the heck the expression cutting is. Cutting hot ice with butter. Hot, yes, there you go. Exactly. Um, so you're not going to get that and I know that and that's okay. And I just get into that, whatever pen I'm using. So anyway, moving on. Next question we have is from Caitlin Swigert. Uh, best pens for lefties, parentheses, penabling a friend. So thinking about left a lefty a gift pen. I thought this is interesting. Nice. So what do you think, Drew? Yeah. Well, first of all, yay for penabling. Thank you for that. Um, my first thought is probably avoid stub nibs since uh, they tend to be more uh, sensitive to angle and rotation. You really need to, if it's a new user, especially if it's mm -hmm. not a new user, then sure, if they can, you know, control that. But honestly, one of the biggest challenges of picking up a fountain pen for the first time is keeping it in that same position. It's very counterintuitive to growing up with just being able to rotate that thing however you want to with a rollerball or a pencil. So that can be a challenge. It's a little bit more of a challenge with a flat uh, stub nib. And I'll say what I said earlier, uh, left-handed grips are often just as varied as right-handed grips, especially in terms of holding a fountain pen. People hold them all sorts of which ways. So I wouldn't say that um, a uh, pen with a grip, like a molded grip, like the 2000, sorry, not like the 2000, like the Safaris or the Lamy All-Stars would be necessarily good or bad because a lot of right-handed users can't stand those things either. But a lot of right-handed users swear by them and say that they are really helpful in learning how to grip them. So it depends. That could be really helpful, but then it could be the opposite as well. So I would just say, take that into account, consider it maybe, but it's not a definite win. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of left-handed writers, not all of them, but a lot of them are challenged by inks that don't dry quickly. So starting off, like there are a lot of inks that aren't marketed as fast dry inks that are indeed fast dry inks, but it takes a little bit of hunting down to do that. You could always look on our website and check out the reviews. We have a little slider for dry time and a lot of them are, a lot of them have a ton of reviews. So you can check that out and kind of decide on your own whether or not it's a fast drying ink. You'll at least be able to tell if it's definitely not one because people usually say, or you could start off with a brand that does advertise the fact that it's a fast drying ink like Private Reserve. They have a whole line of fast drying ink. So that might be a good starting point for you and your penablees. And um, then finally, picking a middle of the road notebook for that same reason. A paper like Clairefontaine or Rhodia is not going, the ink's going to sit on top of those papers for a little bit longer than it would with one of those middle of the road type of notebooks like Leuchtsturm. That one is a little bit more absorbent. So picking something like that could be helpful for dry time. Great points. These are all great points. Um, my opinion is that it's not necessarily so much about the specific pen. You know, Drew mentioned a few. I think if you're if you're dealing with somebody that's never written with a fountain pen, I'm a little more inclined to push something that has a more of a triangular grip, just because it is 
it does sort of force them to, you know, hold that thing in the right direction, even if that's not ultimately their preference. Going with something like a Lamy Safari or a Pelican Twist or something like that, that really kind of forces you to hold it in that grip. Um, it's just kind of a good reminder for somebody that's never really had to think about that. Um, so I'm not, I'm not opposed to kind of pushing somebody in that direction if it's for somebody that's, that's brand new to it all. Um, or like a Twisby Eco T. It's got like a very gentle triangular yeah. grip, but it's not like so aggressive. It's got these like sharp edges that could really bother somebody. Um, so that could be a good option. Um, Drew mentioned the dry time and smearing. I think that's really important, um, especially with lefty. If you know this person well enough and you know kind of how they write, um, a lot of people may write either hook handed or overhand like this, or like the side writer, you know, those are the ones that smear the worst. But if you, if it's somebody who's underhand writing uh, with the left hand, you basically don't have to make much of any special consideration from somebody who'd be right-handed because you're kind of avoiding, you know, all the writing just with your hand position. So you have a lot more freedom and options there. So, um, you know, that's something to think about as well. Um, I think you're kind of have a balance here between what Drew said, like with the ink that dries fast, that kind of thing. Um, you know, with the smearing and all that, you also, because your nibs, you're writing in a push motion when you're left-handed, um, you're trying to balance out, like trying to minimize that dry time. So having like a finer nib, um, can put down less ink and help with the dry time, but also the finer the nib you go, the toothier it can be, you know, so it may not feel quite as smooth. So it's going to be a little bit of a balance. I think if you go with a fine nib, you know, it's going to be pretty safe bet all around. Um, you know, like Drew said, like avoiding a stub, avoiding a flex and stuff at first, just try to go with a conventional fine nib is pretty safe bet to get you a good balance there. Go with a pretty conventional ink, something that doesn't have a super heavy saturation, a lot of sheen or shimmer or anything like that. So that if there is any smearing, you know, that's going to be minimized. Um, and then um, just encourage them to use a lighter hand. You know, a lot of people when they first use fountain pens, they're used to really having, or they're, they're used to really having to bear down on things like ballpoints and rollerballs, pencils, stuff like that. So really, really, really drilling that home with the new person uh, to somebody who's left-handed that they're going to be, you know, e even more impacted by that uh, push motion that if they're bearing down really hard, they're essentially like driving down that nib into the paper. So they're really going to want to keep a, a light hand. So I would encourage, um, you know, a gift item being something with a pretty stiff steel nib, uh, something that doesn't have a lot of give to it so that it stays, um, you know, uh, pretty, pretty firm and won't have a tendency to, to want to dig into the paper like that. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, going with absorbent paper, fast drying ink and all that, the Drew recommended, uh, is really good. And then as the person, you know, gets to know the pens more and more, they will uh, be able to vary their own experience and can kind of tweak it, uh, from there on out based on their own, you know, lefty writing preference. Yeah. Very cool. Fantastic. All right. Well, Riddle of <coughs> Epsilon asks... Mm. What was Ink Novo? Brian always says it in old videos, and I've always wondered. <laughs> Brian, what the heck? Ink Novo. N O V O. Ink Novo. Novo. Ink Novo. Um, yeah, good question. I always wondered why I said it myself, too. Um, <laughs> so, no, it was Ink Novo. N O U V E A U. So nouveau is in French for new. So it was my clever naming convention for the original blog that we started 12 years ago, as well as the YouTube channel was the Ink Nouveau. Uh, and it was a play on words with, you know, new ink basically being new ink as in like, hey, fountain pen ink. Like there's a lot of new fountain pen inks and it's like a new thing that a lot of people were discovering. And it was also new in terms of, hey, there's this like digital form of blogging and, you know, video content and stuff like that. It was a new way of communicating new ink. I thought it was really clever at the time. And uh, I guess to some degree it was. But what I quickly realized was that trying to build a online retail store of gouletpens.com and then trying to build a separate brand name on the blog and the YouTube channel, which were very closely linked and related to Goulet Pens. Uh, I should have just called it all Goulet Pens from the very beginning. And we eventually dropped the Ink Nouveau thing, converted over the YouTube channel name, converted the blog over to Goulet Pens blog. And that was many, many years ago. But all the original videos are still out there. So you see me talking about Ink Nouveau and everybody's like, what is this thing? Whatever, who cares? Uh, and I'm surprised I don't get asked about it more, to be quite honest with you. But I think it's because... You know, most people don't, don't watch those older videos. <laughs> 
or they see me with the newer videos and they're like, oh, that was a while ago. Uh, we'll just uh, let that slide. <laughs> so they just move on. But there you go. That's the, that's it. So it's like for all the old, the, the OG Goulet Pens fans, they're like, oh yeah, Nouveau, that was a thing. Um, and then, you know, they forget about it. <laughs> but it's also, uh, that's also why our exclusive Edison is called the Edison premier nouveau right or it was called the nouveau it's not a, we dropped that too yeah didn't we? we dropped that too that was like the last <gasps> that's lingering, right that was like the last that was. Lingering thing yeah. we just dropped that like last year i think yeah especially because it was like edison nouveau premier blah 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 whatever the model yeah name. so now it's just and the it was premier. just like all right this is so many names do we really need all this stuff yep you know you live and learn you figure things out over time but no regrets i mean it got us to where we are but yeah. you know probably could have done it differently but anyway all right, so this question comes from Pilot823, which I think is a pretty cool IG handle. Uh, I have to say we're both big fans. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Is there a fountain pen no longer in production that you wish you had bought? That you wish you had bought. So I don't know how you interpreted this, Drew. I interpreted it as this was like, since you and I didn't grow up using fountain pens, that this is like once we had like fountain pen consciousness, once we were, were like fountain pen aware, that's when the, the clock starts ticking. So like you couldn't go back and say like, oh, a, a Parker 51 when it was first released, like that was before we were born. So I wouldn't classify it that. I would say something that I wish I had bought that was in production, but is no longer in production. Do you know what I'm saying? I think you're reading way too much into this. Okay, probably. <laughs> I just took it literally, like, is there a fountain pen that's no longer in production that you wish you had bought, like, right now? Like, is there a fountain pen that is not being made anymore that you wish you would have bought when it was being made? Yeah, but if it was stopped made before we were born, like, we could never have bought it because we weren't alive. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, you go ahead and give your answer. I don't think it actually changes. Okay, I don't yeah, think it actually I mean, changes either of our answers, but go ahead. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so uh, a, a couple years ago, well, not a couple, several years ago, Pilot had a pen called the Stargazer, which mm. was a short pen. It had the same, um, uh, it had a gold nib, and it was, uh, but it was about the size of a Prera, and it had a yeah. just or beautifully. Like the, like the E95S, like that size. Yeah, beautifully satisfying cap, uh, snap cap, mm. and a little bit of a sparkle to the resin. And I loved it when we had it. I knew it was being discontinued. I didn't buy it. And now I'm kicking myself because I want it now more than ever. So, But that's next on my list. I had the E95S on my list, and now I have one. So I'm coming for you, <laughs> um, Stargazer. And now I'll say that, but then I'll also say right now, we have an exclusive. Uh, wait, no, it's not an exclusive. Is the Miami Knights? Yeah, it's exclusive. No, it's an ascent. Yeah, an ascent is our exclusive. Yeah. yeah. So we have the Edison Miami Knights ascent on our website, and uh, that is not coming back once it's gone. Yeah. Um, and I need to buy one, and I have time. We have all of the nib sizes in stock. Like, there's no reason I shouldn't buy one. It would go perfectly with my pen case. Yeah, it would. So if I don't buy one, I am a fool. But I haven't done it yet, despite having known that they're, this is it. So this is kind of this is bringing up some stuff for me right now. I need to I need to get on that. <laughs> also, I kind of wish this isn't a fountain pen. But when Retro Fifty One came up came uh, came along with the Stan pen, Brian, the little hockey hockey ice themed pen. Yeah, I'm not a hockey guy, but that's a cool pen, and it was like the only clear retro they ever did. And I just oh, that's true. That's true. In like, retrospective, I was like, Why would, I was, uh, <laughs> yeah. I just I wish wow. I had picked that one up too. It was just really unique and cool. Interesting. So yeah, yeah. okay. Well, I would not have guessed that that was one that you would ever get not having. Yeah, it kind of is. I mean, I don't like. I'm not going to eBay it or anything because God prices. But yeah, you know, if if I, I would have bought it with you know, hmm. yeah, when it was there. What about you? Fair enough. W about a pen that was that you could not have bought because it was before you gained fountain pen consciousness. <laughs> well, I apparently way overthought this more than <laughs> Drew did because fountain pens have been around for a really long time. So I could always say like, oh, I wish I wish I had bought, you know, literally, it could, you could literally just make that anything. Like I, I, 
I, I, I've already expressed how I interpreted the question. <laughs> I don't need to explain myself more. Um, so I viewed it as this pen had to be something that was available at a time, you know, 12 years and sooner, because that's when I became fountain pen aware. Um, so for me, I, I honestly don't have an extensive list here because I, if anybody knows me, I have not really exercise a lot of personal restraint when it's come to acquiring pens. So I don't really have <laughs> a lot of things missing from my collection that I wish I had. You don't have a stargazer. You know, I need to double check on that. I don't think you do. I don't know if I do either. I might, but I don't know. I'll have to double check. Mm. I, I literally have to check my spreadsheet of my catalog of what I have. But I'm with you. If I don't, if, if I don't actually already have a stargazer, that would be one that I wish that I had. Yeah. Um, but another one that would fall into that category would be a uh, Omos 360. That was the triangular Omos. Mm -hmm. It was just really, really unique. And I thought that was cool. Um, now, there is one color vintage turquoise that was really just cool. It's like a turquoise demo color that I just, I really dig. And they just, they didn't have a lot of pens that color at that time. This was probably 10 years ago, maybe older. I'm not sure. I don't actually, that was a limited edition. I don't actually know when that pen was available. Um, but either way, I would take basically any Omos 360, which was definitely available when I was fountain pen aware. So that would probably be the one. But again, I'm like you, I'm like, I'm not going to eBay the thing because it's going to be so ridiculously priced at this point. Um, and the other one, if we're going to go back, like before I was fountain pen aware, um, the Namiki custom impressions, that's the like celluloid. They look so oh, good. Yeah. I have a couple of the colors of them, but I basically would want one in every color. So just filling out the collection of all of the colors of that celluloid would definitely, that would actually probably be top of my list. If, Absolutely. If, if we broadly interpret the question. Yeah, those are gorgeous, gorgeous pens. Yeah, but what would you all? What would you all get? Curious to know if you drop in the comments, um, what, uh, however you choose to interpret the question, uh, what pens would you uh, would you wish you'd bought? All right, Drew. All right, last question, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'm gonna read this as Jim Chaos mm -hmm. asks us, "What's the best combination of things to give someone if you want to convert them to fountain pens?" The best combination, I would say a cash basket and a link to gouletpens.com. Ah, I'm just kidding, but not really. Um, they can't use the cash for gouletpens.com. No, actually, you'd have to deposit <laughs> it and then all that, but you know, I had to throw in a little office reference in there for you, Drew. Cash um, basket. Cash basket. Um, so for me, for personal gifts, I like to keep it simple. When I say personal gifts, I mean like friends, family members, that kind of stuff. Because I operate in the pen world. I have like business associates, things like that. So I'll call it like personal gifts versus professional gifts. Um, so for personal gifts, it's more about like just making it easy for them to get into the writing experience. Not necessarily going for something that looks particularly, you know, fancy or impressive. Um, Pilot Varsity, I think is a great option. It's already inked up. It's really pretty dummy proof. Even somebody that's just like not wanting anything to do with the maintenance and filling of a fountain pen, but they just want like to jump right to the good stuff, which is smooth flowing, nice writing, that kind of thing. Um, I think the Pilot Varsity is a great way to go. Um, I've even like backtracked into Pilot Varsities with family members who, you know, have gotten like a pilot metropolitan or something like that and they just like they don't clean it often enough and they do something and it's just like too much hassle for them to kind of deal with i'm like okay here's a varsity and they're like oh this is the greatest thing ever and i just buy them varsities from then on out um so great kind of fallback option i think the gin house sharks are a lot of fun you can start with cartridges with those or you can get into kind of the full bottle if they're into that um for my professional you know like gifting if you will Again, I still keep it pretty reasonable. I'm not talking about anything crazy. Um, but the Twisby Eco, big fan of that one because it looks really nice. You get a lot of bang for the buck. You get to see kind of how the pen works. So for somebody that's newer to fountain pens, it's very easy to kind of understand how it's filling, how it's kind of working because you can see all the components to it. And it just looks really crisp, really clean, and it, and it functions really well. Um, and then usually a bottle of Pilot Roshizuku because the bottle itself just looks really good. All the ink performs really well. If I'm, you know, I love Konpeki, so I'll often default to that as a gift item. But if I'm 
talking to, you know, we're in like the e-commerce space. I network with a lot of other business owners. So if I see that they have a company logo or some color theme to them, I will try to gift them a bottle of the closest thing to their kind of known color that they enjoy or their brand color or something. And that's a nice little touch that they always appreciate. Um, just like if anybody ever gives me anything blue, I'm like, yay, you've seen any video I've ever done. Um, and then <laughs> Uh, I always try to give a Rodia number 16 dot pad. It's just such a classic, great introduction. The format is perfect because everybody's familiar with that sort of size, like the legal pad type, you know, format of notebook. You tear it out, it's perforated. You know, you can use the dots or ignore them. You know, they're there if you need them, but they're not so intrusive like a, like a lined paper would be where you like feel forced to fit your handwriting into it. So, um, and the paper quality is just really, really good. So it's a nice introduction. So I will often couple the three of those together as like a sort of a gift set. How about you? Very Jim? nice. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. That's, those are solid choices. Uh, my suggestion is to make it uh, easy and fun. So give them mm. something that they can get excited about. Don't go all the way easy. Don't go all the way fun. A nice balance that does them both mm. because you want it to be accessible, but you also want them to recognize the fact that fountain pens are cool and they want to stick with it. Uh, my suggestion is the Twisby Swipe. I think that that one offers a range of ways you can use it. You can start off with just the cartridge, that big honking cartridge that it comes with. It's easy to use. Pop, you're good. And I think that going with a finer nib so that you can write on a more wide variety of paper, you don't even have to give them paper if you don't want to, if you go with one of the more fine nibs. And then if later they exhaust the cartridge, they can try the more traditional piston converter that comes with the pen. And then after that, if they want to get a little bit more crazy, they can go with the fun uh, spring converter that, ha that that pen has. Not only that, but... And Brian's remembering all the wacky stuff that we did with those things. Oh, yeah, flinging it across um, the room and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And another thing, though, is you is the presentation is really, really solid. Just like what Brian was talking about with the Eco. Twisby, their branding, their marketing, and their packaging is just really, really stylish. And they don't – they pay attention to everything. With the swipe, you get a sleeve that looks nice, that – clamshell uh, white plastic thing everything's in little baggies very very nicely presented and then if you wanted to pair that with one of the new inks that we talked about at the beginning of the show those are nicely packaged as well little frosted bottles with a translucent red cap with a the logo there the whole thing looks very well themed together if you just want to get them that one pen and that one ink that's in my opinion, a perfect way to get somebody started. And everything's branded nicely together. It doesn't look like it's a hodgepodge of a bunch of different stuff that you found at different stores. I like that cohesion aspect of it. And I think that that's uh, what I'm going to be doing for a couple people this year. I, the swipe really, really impressed me this year. And uh, already I'm, I've got some uh, thoughts on people I'm going to throw some at. Nice. It's awesome. You know, I don't gift as many pens as I should to my family members. I mean, I well at this point, I, I think you know who wants yeah, one and who doesn't. I, I did it hard a while ago, and I kind of like either they got really into it or kind of exhausted everybody. Plus, with us and like our our immediate family, I'm talking like obviously like my own children, but then we'll, we'll get them pens. But like you know, my like sister and parents, and you know, Rachel's you know slightly extended family. I'm not talking like cousins and random stuff, but um. Uh, we like don't exchange gifts as adults. We're like, we'll get gifts for the kids, but we're all like, we're like, we got enough going on with the yeah. young kids and all that. Like, can we just like not? And then we, none of us have to worry about that. So that's kind of more the route that we've gone. Maybe that's why I haven't given out as many is because I think that's pretty common. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, yeah. we've gotten there too, but yeah. I think that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, like I think, uh, I think that I'm going to do, uh, going to get Archer's uh, teacher one. Oh, that's a great idea. That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah, very cool. Okay, um, Drew, we had a lot of extra questions. So we we forewent the hypothetical for this week and opted for something. I mean, we've done like a full Q&A kind of thing before, but you have uh, what is in the notes as the silly lightning round of questions. So we're gonna try this out. We're gonna see how it goes. It's a bunch of random questions, some pen related, some not. But Drew basically approached me and he was like, we've got all these random questions that people ask us and we just ignore them all the time. So can we just like try doing a bunch of them really quickly and then see if people like it? So that's what we're doing right now. Um, so I'm going to kick it off, Drew. This is from fishgirl63 on Instagram. Why did Drew shave the beard? 
because it was itchy and Halloween is over. I was going to be Dr. Strange, but I shaved it too soon. So I was a hairless Dr. Strange. The end. It's gone. I hate it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Now you get to ask. Brian, <laughs> where do baby pens come from? Baby pens. Yes, baby pens. Well, we're going to have the talk. We're going to have the talk right now. When two pens really love each other very much. Okay, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> Mo- let's, let's move on. That's, I'm, I'm already offended. We won't go there. We won't go there. There are so many euphemisms in the pen world, but we're going to keep it family friendly. I'll just allude to the euphemisms. Okay, this is from Captain Quark. Drew, would you rather eat mint dots for a month or use nothing but cheap ballpoints for a month? Mm. All right. First off, Captain Quark, I will never forgive you for betraying Ratchet and Clank. You know what you did. And this is the exact same sort of question I would expect from you. Agent I don't know chaos. when you're going to learn your lesson. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, uh, I would absolutely use a rollerball. I'm not or ballpoint. I'm not messing with no dots. The end. For a month? All right. Yeah, absolutely. You kidding me? I'm not eating dots for a month. Does that mean like continuously eating dots? I don't know. I don't non-stop. even care. If, if, if it was even one a day. All right, fair enough. No, no, no. Ew, no, 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 no. All right, all right. All right. Brian, what is the deal with airline food? With airline food? Well, What's the deal? I would say that it's for the birds. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm... Very nice. All right, Drew. Ruby Fox 28 says, Drew, please share the ink mixing formula for summoning... Cthulhu, Cthulhu, Cthulhu? Brian, we that? talked about this. Cthulhu, remember we, Cthulhu. this is this this is an earlier pencast throwback for when you Man, didn't know if Cthulhu was fiction remember, or nonfiction. I don't remember anything. I don't think it was actually spelled out like that. It sounds familiar now that you said it, but type, this is the way Cthulhu is spelled. Typed out, it looks really strange to me. But anyway, Cthulhu. What's the ink mixing formula for summoning All right. Cthulhu? Well, I, I went into my vault and I actually am going to break it down for you. So. Don't hold me responsible. All right, so it is equal parts of all of the Noodler's Russian inks, two parts Organic Studios Nitrogen, a splash of Diamine Registrar's Blue Black, shaken up with a hair from John Lane's mustache, a whalebone from Nathan Tardiff's basement, mixed inside of Fig Boot's favorite golf bag while playing Stephen Brown's intro music on his YouTube channel. Wow. Again, do not hold me accountable. This will work. And honestly, wow. uh, yeah, I don't know. Go for it. Whatever. I don't even care anymore. Wow. All right. Drew gave his disclaimers, but you asked, so knock yourself out, Ruby Fox. It's frankly just irresponsible, but whatever. (laughs) All right, right, Drew, you got the next one for us? Yeah, yeah, Brian. uh, Someone asked, can they get free pens? Probably. All right, great. Next question, Eva Buck X. Drew, (laughs) how are your... How... how, Grammar. How... Are you drinking those huge cups of coffee and tea and not going to the toilet for two hours? <laughs> oh, actually, no, we should move on. I need to this. Yeah, we need to we need to move on. This is I did just drink all that. So, oh. no, actually, I'm only halfway <laughs> through my coffee yet. So, mm. <laughs> but is when it, we're done recording, I, I, I run away. Is that a full mug of coffee? Because that's like two cups of coffee in that thing. Yeah. Yeah. And this this one's already done. Tea, tea's already done. Oh, so. my gosh. So it's like two cups of tea and two cups of coffee. This is what I do every podcast, yeah. Four cups of liquid. Oh. All right, fair enough. All right, Brian, (laughs) biggest question. We're going to finish this thing off with the biggie. Okay. Cakeology asks, why? Why? That's it? Mm Mm-hmm. Why? That's it. That's it. Uh, Why not? Ooh. That's what I got to say. Why not? All right. Very, very nice. All right. So those were the silly, <laughs> nonsensical questions that we've been ignoring for probably several months at this point. Maybe for um, good reason. We'll find out. Yeah. So don't let this encourage you to ask silly questions. Oh, they'll get asked they'll prob- anyway. We don't even have yeah, to, we don't even have to we'll, encourage or discourage. They're going to come. We'll, we'll probably still ignore them, but you never know <laughs> if it's an entertain- entertaining enough. Fair enough. That's that. All, All right. right. So there's our random segment for today. Indeed. Next to on to the next random segment, which is not random but planned, we got our pens of the week. So, Drew, you carried around the Pilot E95S, your new love child. Um, it really is. I'm I'm and, so uh, so I'm still honeymooning with this pen. There you go. And I had the Tachia Miyabi Winter Breath. So, uh, tell us what you think about your E95S. We know that you already loved it, and you will not shut up about it. 
So now you get to actually talk about it with our permission. Go ahead. I don't really have a lot to say about this pen, actually. I don't like it anymore. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's hey, that happens better. sometimes. Sometimes you really love a pen, and then when you start to use no, it all the time, you're no, like, oh, I'm, no, thanks. Uh, no, honestly, like this... This is like my favorite pen right now. I don't see how this this could get better. The only way it could be better, Brian, is mm. if you could take the nib out. That is my one complaint. I like yeah. to be able to service my own pens. Okay. I like to be able to really clean the feeds. Like mm. I take it apart and get a toothbrush in there if I need to. Um, and I do not have the option with this one because both the feed and the nib are inaccessible. Uh, are you so sure? That, are you sure they're inaccessible? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you really try... Maybe you can No, do it. I'm 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 sure. Uh I, I I spoke to a pen friend about uh who mentioned last week, uh actually um I believe it might have been Alan. Anyway, uh they said that my my thought on not having the Namiki Silvern Sterling Silver pen as my heirloom pen was a good idea because mm. they in fact had to go get it service one time, and neither uh, Mark Bacchus nor Gina Salarino could guarantee results because they cannot take the nib off. Oh, gosh. Um, so I figured if they can't do it, I certainly cannot do it, nor should I try because they are the experts. Um, now, mm. the, he did ultimately say that Linda Kennedy was able to get it off, and being a student of the great and powerful Richard Bender, I'm not mm. super surprised by that, but still not uh, not something that I would consider user serviceable. So that's my one complaint, but okay. also that I think is offset by just how freaking cool it looks. So um, it is a phenomenal writer. I love the feel in the hand because you can write with it. It does not have a predetermined grip section. Basically the whole front end of the pen is a potential grip section for you. Mm. So you can, you know, choke up on it, you can lean back. And even if you wanted to write with it halfway through the barrel, it there's barely a step at all. So that's one advantage you get with um a uh, snap cap. Even though this isn't really a snap, it's more of a push push cap. There's no mm. snapping that happens. Um extraordinarily comfortable to write with. And one thing that we haven't talked about, and I know that we have mentioned the E95S a few times in recent episodes, but we haven't mentioned how this cap actually feels, Brian. Mm. Um, we've talked about how the color talk, combination we've talked, is. We talked about it a little bit, but what would you consider this? It's it's this the way this cap feels is unlike any other material of modern produced fountain pens that we sell. I don't think any other pen is made from this material. It's almost a satin metal. Oh, you're talking like not the action of capping it and uncapping no, it. No, no, the, the actual the physical actual material. Yes, this, I, hmm. and I don't think it's this way on the black one. I think it's only the uh, the really? silver and champ the champagne and maroon one. Yeah, whatever this thing's called. Huh. I don't think so. This, this, it like, this cap feels like it looks. It has this like soft look to it and it actually feels that way. I, I cannot describe like it. A, you know what I'm talking about. You've, you've. I do know what you're talking about. I'm trying to think of how to put it into words. But I'm right, right? Like, it's got a unique feel to it. Right? At least, all right, confirm with me. So I'm, I'm trying not, to remember okay. feeling... Oh, dang it. All ...many, right. many different pens. It it feels... I, I think satiny is the right word for it. Sure. But basically, if you look at the pen and say, like, you know what, that looks like it should feel kind of satiny. It does. So I'm, It totally does. I'm wondering if it really feels that different from... Say like a uh, like the the vanishing point, the limited edition one, either from this year or like uh, maybe the the twilight or the crimson sunrise, anything that has many many layers of lacquer on it, because I believe that is how this is made. I believe it is metal with many coats of lacquer on it, and you're probably mm. feeling just a lot of layers of lacquer there. Maybe I have to wonder given that it's the same, you know, company making these things, if that's sort of how it is. Cause I, but I think the fact that it's such a lighter pen, it probably just like somehow registers differently in your brain that you're feeling it differently than maybe you would a vanishing point. Cause there's so much more weight to that pen and the hardware has a different texture to it and all that stuff. So I, I, I wonder if it's that, that different from one of those, but it, I, I will, I, I will say that cool. there have been a lot of people in the comments that have also owned this pen said, absolutely. This is, this needs to be recognized more as one of my go-tos. Mm. Please let me know. Am I crazy saying that this cap feels unlike anything else or does it actually? Mm. Um, so 
anyway, that being said, those are the things that I noticed that I hadn't really paid attention to until I really focused on it before, but it's a joy to write with. It feels amazing and it is a great pocket pen because it is a bit shorter. So I've got no complaints. I used Noodler's Nightshade, which is one of my favorite inks, and I love writing the word nightshade, and that's one of the reasons I pick it, because it's a nice color, uh, but the yeah. word nightshade is so much fun to write. Um, I would recommend this pen to anybody looking for a next level pen, a first gold nib pen, or if they literally just say, I want to only buy one fountain pen, what's it going to be? Even though you can't pull the nib on this thing, I still say this would be in my top three if you only had to have one pen list. And that, that that's pretty much it for me, Brian. <coughs> that says something because you've handled quite a few pens. I have. I have this one. Now, ask me again next year, but I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to think I'm going to fall out of love with this one. It's going to stay in the rotation for quite a while, huh? Oh God! It's gonna to be tough it to unseat it, that one. It it can't. It can't. I've got. I, I haven't been rotating hardly at all because I'm in love with the pens that I have so much. That's because you need more pens in your system. No, I'm just no. saying. I'm just saying. That just means I <laughs> am an educated consumer, Brian. Fair enough. In the real world, you probably would just not buy as many pens, and you'd be just happy using the ones that you know you really love. I would absolutely. But since you live in Goulet Pens fantasy land. You could just get to keep getting pens shoved in your face, and you're like, oh, "Okay, fine, it's, I'll use, I'll use this new cool, gorgeous pen that nobody else gets to use yet." It's, it's a very difficult life. It's tough. We should all feel really sorry for Drew. Um, I'm just kidding. We should, but not for that reason. Um, so, <laughs> I haven't picked on you enough in this podcast. Okay, Tachia Miyabi Winter Breath. This is the one that I used, um, which he got at the gum counter at his local gas station and it gives, yeah. leaves his breath feeling witty, <laughs> minty fresh that's right yeah these uh dime a dozen pens here so this is um not the kind of pen that i necessarily would carry around like every single day um not a cargo shorts pen it's not a it's not a cargo shorts pen uh, i did keep this one in a pen case with me the thing i will say having handled it a bit it's a it's a bigger pen than i kind of initially uh, thought. It's very light, which is good. So um, it was very comfortable to write with. Uh, however, just like wielding it around, it's like, it feels like a lot of pen and I have big hands. So I think this is probably how m most people with smaller hands feel about most pens. Most pens feel just small in my hands. And when I feel one that actually feels like substantial, I'm like, wow, this is a whole different experience. I I really like this. this. This feels really good. Like I wish all the pens were this size as a standard and then, you know, a big pen would just have to be absolutely enormous. Um, so that was kind of an interesting experience for me. You know, the thing that I think, uh, obviously the Rodden, I, I don't know. I don't even know where to start with this pen. It writes great. Okay. So it's the nib. It's a Tachi nib. It's made by Sailor. Great writing nibs. Oh my gosh. And this is an extra fine too, which normally... Yeah, I'm pretty picky with my extra fines, and I wouldn't necessarily get such a nib uh, on just like an everyday carry pen because I tend to like broader nibs. Um, but this this extra fine just writes so well. Um, it was really kind of What number cool. did you get? Uh, I can't tell you. <laughs> mm. Rachel actually picked out the number for me. Gotcha. Uh, it's number one. But... I don't normally like to get number one because I like to let that like get out into circulation and get out there into the world. But Rachel snagged it for me while I was out of town and I was like, oh, okay, well. Gotcha. You, she she you asked me, she's it. like, what do you think is more important to Brian? She asked me, what do you think is more important to Brian? <laughs> uh, number or nib size? And I said, I don't know, probably number. So. Uh, it, I used to care about number. Now I, I really don't, you know. Oh, I just really? Like, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. This is not as important to me. Um, so would, would you say nib size is more important? Um. Yeah. Oh, darn it. So I Maybe. was just wrong. Yeah, you don't know me at all, Drew. I, I mean, I knew you cared. I didn't think you cared that much. I thought you were more. You would be more interested in the collectability aspect. You know what? Honestly, I don't know. I just, I, I've cared less about either over time. You know, if it's like a pen that has a specific um, uniqueness to its nib, like, for example, if it's like a sailor with a zoom nib or something like that, then... I have like a disproportionate number of sailor pens with zoom nibs on them because you can only get that on a sailor. So mm -hmm. um, that's where I'll care more about the nib is I 
I really care about having more of a well-rounded experience, more of a well to draw upon when I'm reviewing and playing with different pens. Uh, and the number itself doesn't really matter to me quite as much. Like the collectability, like I don't have a single number that is like my number. Like you've got the 84 thing, which is cool, but I don't like identify with a specific number quite as much. So the nib size cool. okay. tends to matter more, but I'm not like die on the sword, you know, for either. Um, so anyway. Sorry. So large pen, beautiful. The craftsmanship is just insane. And I think what's so cool, this is, I think this is the first pen that I have that has uh, eggshell in it, which that's where you get the wintry breath kind of thing. And I'll just have to like zoom in just a tad to show you um, some of the deets of it. The, the pictures we have of this are really crisp and look really good. Um, but what's so cool, not only is the pattern, how it kind of wraps around the pen. I think that's part of why this pen is so large is because it just makes for a great canvas. But you know, the pattern is really cool, but it's not just a uniform kind of eggshell thing. You can see how the eggshell kind of gets a little bit thinner as it gets over to the rodden. Just visually, it's very striking. And then of course the wrap, you know, going across the body of the pen up into the cap looks amazing. Um, I think the, the rhodium clip was a good call. And the grip is what does it for me, Drew. Just this grip with the like, you know, snowy kind of thing, like that that and it's like i'm touching it it's like oh it's it's just yeah anyway can can so, you can you feel the uh eggshell not really no it's no? it's okay. pretty smooth over top yeah you're not like because otherwise that would actually probably feel pretty weird like i wasn't I sure if you could maybe be. feel um raised portions of the lacquer that sits over top of the eggshell no i guess not i guess it's pretty yeah, i guess my, my wording was wrong i didn't think you would actually feel the eggshell itself but like where it crosses from eggshell into rodden or something like that. Yeah. No, it's all very uniform. No. It's many, many, many layers of lacquer on top of this thing. Um, so I just, I appreciate the craftsmanship. I know what goes into it. And it just, it's just amazing. So um, to me, it's a work of art and it is, it is primarily that. So yes, I would, I would use it, but uh, you know, so it's going to be kind of big to fit in, a, in most of your pen cases. I think it would fit in most of the bigger ones. So I have this like little Girologio two pen. I don't even think we carry this, but I've been using it um, for a while. And it's like, you can see it even kind of like sticks out of the top there. You know, there's a Lamy 2000 kind of hanging out down there. So it's like, it's like a full inch longer than a Lamy 2000. So it's like, it's a little bit cumbersome to kind of carry around with you. Not that you probably would want to do so without serious thought anyway, given the special nature of the pen. But to me, it's like, this is the kind of thing that I would leave like out on a desk and like just, just admire it and then use it every now and then for like really special reasons. But is yeah. that, uh, is that the Oxblood um, case? The what? The Oxblood Girologio case? Yes. Yeah, we do, we do carry that. The two pen? I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if we carried the two pen. Oh, there you go. So we do have it. Um, I've been Forty-two ninety-nine in stock at GoodlayPens.com. I've been using this sucker for like a while. It's held up really well. I keep it in my backpack along with a lot of other crap. You know me, Drew. I shove a lot of stuff in my backpack. I wouldn't want to be in there. Yeah, but the fact that it's like kind of a hard, you know, case, like that's what I prefer for my bigger pens, and it's got a lot of room in there too. So anyway, very nice. cool. Um, and I used it with Dymine Majestic Blue, which I have not used in a while. Um, you know, Dime Majestic Blue, it's got a really nice sheen to it. It's a dark blue. And uh, the only problem was you don't really see much of the sheen with the extra fine nib. So, right. you know, it's a kind of thing like, okay, yes, it looks really good. It's a great ink, but it's not showing off all of its best properties in such a fine nib. Because that Sailor made extra fine is really, really fine. But I mean, the flow is really consistent. It looks great. Um, my feed is nice and like shiny and red because <laughs> Majestic Blue will do that. Um, but it's it's definitely a nice alternative. Like I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't want to put something like uh, Organic Studio Nitrogen in a pen like this because then it's like you're inviting like Sheen City forever and you got to like really scrub that thing out. I wouldn't want to do that on such a limited pen. Um, but a Majestic Blue, like I'll use that clearly because I did. Um, it performed really well. The only thing that I probably am not like, this is really a personal preference thing on my part. Um, there's a couple of pens out there like this one, the Esther Brooks. Um, they've got like a little bit of that spring tension kind of in there. I don't know how much I love that personally. I think I would rather just have, you know, cause like 
sometimes if I'm like rushing or I'm not really paying attention, it can like slip out of my fingers a little bit. I don't know that I love that so much, but it's, it's not a big deal. I think I would rather just have like a positive, you know, catch on a thread without having to like kind of press in a little bit, but it seals really well. So I'm sure that's, that's part of the reason why it's designed that way. But I don't mean, there you go. I enjoy, there you go indeed. I enjoy it very much and I'll probably keep using it. So do you want to decide on something to use for next week or do you want to go the uh, individual route again? Good question. We've so, had a couple requests. Have we? Okay. We have. What have the requests the, been? The requests have been for a Lamy Studio. Oh, okay. Like and just, I'll that's say, it? Uh, okay. That, that, that's the one that has been requested. I've seen it brought up at least twice, yeah. Um, okay. So I was thinking that that one might not be a terrible idea. I personally have never written for a long period of time with a studio. I don't own one. Um, I've The grip has never bothered me, but I've wondered, what about for long writing sessions or just using it more? Um, will I have something to say about uh, the potentially slippery grip? Okay. I think that's a great option then. So we have a couple of different ways to go with the Lamy Studio. So uh, you have the stainless steel studio, which has that rubbery grip. Mm. So that would not accomplish anything of what you just talked about. So I think you should mm. for sure use the slippery grip. Yeah. How Some about I do a version. how about I do a slippery grip version and then you do a gold nib version? I was thinking like, yeah, do you want to do a gold or steel nib? So I mean, I know I love I've used plenty of both. Um, but I'll use whatever you know would round out the the conversation a little bit. Well, what so. do you what do you what do you have at the house? Um, good question. Maybe that's what I should. should yeah, use that. Use that. I should use what I <laughs> use what I have. What is usable? Yeah. Yeah. That's and then let me let me know, and I'll just pick something different. Okay. Cool. All right. How about as you're talking, I won't pay attention or make faces. I'll just look for a studio, and I'll let you know. And All right. Well. We'll if you out there. there have a studio that you can break out, resurrect, or continue using between now and next week, please join us and together we can assess the studio. I just dropped an empty soda can on the floor. <laughs> I didn't even hear that. Oh, I thought that's what you reacted to. No, no, no. Cool. I'm just making faces. All right. Don't make too many. You get called out on it. All right, next segment. What's happening, Drew? What is happening in your life? Uh, well, every year around this time, we go through my son's room and donate some toys and stuff because, you know, the holidays are coming up, more will arrive, and we yep. don't want things to get overwhelming. So I will say that he did the best job he's ever done in making a trash pile, a donate pile, and a I must keep this random thing, even though it makes no sense pile. <laughs> So uh, makes that no happened. It makes no sense to you. It makes Drew. no sense to me. It's so random. Um, and then, though I will also say that I have be I've begun keeping an attic pile because, as I have been, you know, spending some time on eBay here and there, I'm realizing that there are a lot of toys from my childhood that are worth some money right now. In fact, he saw a some knockoff toy in a uh, toy catalog that was mailed to us and he started telling me about it and i said oh that's that's like mighty max or Polly pocket and he's like what what's that i'm like oh dude you don't know let me just tell you mighty max was the coolest and i just start going on and then i check on ebay i'm like oh my god and just i'm offended by a how expensive they are and then b of course none of them are complete because mighty max toys were tiny 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 yeah and um, so right there, I'm like, man, I wish I would have kept a Mighty Max toy. He would love that thing. So yeah. I'm going to keep some of his stuff in the attic because you never know when, you know, do you, uh, do you think that's going to be the same when our kids get to our age though? Because there's so much stuff out there now, you know what I mean? Like there is, but I also think that toys are becoming more rare. I don't think kids are playing with toys as much anymore, and I don't think hmm. that they're manufacturing them as much anymore. And I think because they're not manufacturing as many of them, just rarity-wise, things are going to go up. I don't know. There's crap everywhere in this house, so there's no shortage of toys. I, I'm thinking mainly like action figures. Like, kids don't play with action figures the way we played with action true. figures. Back in the true. day, if, it, if there was a cartoon, it had action figures attached to it. That's just not the case anymore. That is very true. So there's just fewer of those being made for sure. Anyway, did that. Hmm. Um, 
And then uh, another thing I'm looking very much forward to is uh, a couple weeks ago, I went to see Dune in the movie theater. And that was the first time I'd been in the theater since the pandemic began. And then uh, this week, I'm extraordinarily excited to watch Rocky IV, the Stallone director's cut in the movie theater. And uh, it's a one night only event. I'm just... Rocky IV is one of my all-time favorite movies. If I had to pick my favorite movies overall, I I just say the Rocky films, all of them, except for the five. And so I'm really, really stoked. Not only that, but then the new Ghostbusters movie coming out later this month. I'm feeling pretty spoiled right now. And uh, getting back into the movie theater has been pretty exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. Very cool. That's what's what's going on in my world. (laughs) That's awesome. I know movies and just the whole movie going experience is something that you really enjoy. So that's awesome that you have really like, it's one thing to go and just watch some movie because that's the only thing that's out and you just want to go have that experience, that movie experience. But it's another thing to have something you're also just like really looking forward to seeing. Yeah. I really only go to the theater if I'm really, really excited about it. Otherwise I don't care. I'll wait for it to come out. Fair enough. But um, yeah, I've even started listening to an eighties movie podcast. Like I am really into 80s movies it's it's a it'll suck me right in it's like kryptonite yeah (laughs) that's awesome well less kryptonite more of a moth to the flame i guess there you go there you go um yeah so on my front i had a very busy weekend um ellie uh wanted her room painted we alluded to this i think in the personal message in the newsletter uh but uh you know uh we still have several rooms in our house that are the you know, move in beige or like the, the, the beige that you paint over yes. all your weird colors when you sell your yes. house. Yeah. There's a lot of that. And so, um, you know, both my kids' bedrooms are just plain beige and Ellie's, you know, a tween and she's very excited. She's has her ears pierced now and she is very excited about like making her room color her own. So she picked a nice lavender color called flower girl. Um, yeah, the paint color names are just really fun and crazy um so anyway uh, it's a really nice color actually and uh uh so i did that this weekend and uh gotta say uh it's been a little while since i've actually painted a room um i painted like my parents bedroom like last year or something before that it had been a very long time because i don't know how you feel drew like we had our starter house i fixed dang near everything in that house and then when we sold that and moved here, I was like, I don't want to do a single freaking thing for the rest of my life. And now I do a lot of stuff outside and landscaping, but I just, I have a hard time getting motivated doing some of the things just on the inside of the house. Um, so, but that was pretty fun. I like knocked it out in a very quick period of time because I just forget how much I remember about how to do things like painting. Um, so that was really fun. She absolutely loves it. And it's really fun. Um, did a little bit of outdoor work. So um, you know, I got a friend who is an amateur arborist and, uh, arborist enthusiast, I guess you would call it. So yeah, you can find just like fountain pens, you can find like YouTube videos out there that show you how to like climb trees and tie knots and, you know, fell trees and all that kind of stuff. So that seems right up your alley. It's totally up my alley. So, um, you know, my friend and I have kind of, you know, that is our like friend thing that we do is we take trees down together. So, and I have a lot of trees on my property. So um, we took down like a hundred foot tall pine tree. Um, so he's a, he's a climber. So he, this is the second time we got together because we couldn't take it all down the first time. Um, so he climbed up there and he was like dropping limbs and I'm like chipping and doing the whole thing. So we're like working as a tandem team, you know, doing the whole tree thing. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty fun. And it's just like beautiful fall weather. And I'm like, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. When are you going to buy your climbing gear? Uh, never. I just, I'm not a, not a climber. I don't have a climber's body. You know, I'm a ground guy. Like to keep- I, I would, I would say that there are many lumberjacks that, uh, have more vertically challenged bodies than you. It's one thing to like drop a whole tree when you're on the ground. It's another thing to climb up into a tree. Like it's, it's, I mean, you've seen those guys that like do the, the, shove the plank into the oh, yeah, yeah. slice like come on those dudes I mean, are okay. huge my trees my trees are not that big like you know yes but but that's that's like next level stuff those are actual lumberjacks i'm just a poser um, all right well but <laughs> say, say that to all the bears they they can get up there just fine oh yeah bears are great at climbing trees it's amazing <laughs> um do you know a tree a bear can climb a tree as fast as it can run on the ground so i've heard 
I have heard that. I don't want to. I don't want to confirm that. Though. I don't want to find that out. Yeah, exactly. No, uh, no bears around here that I know of. Um, I've seen coy- or, uh, uh, what is it? We have mountain lions. We have coyotes. Um, and uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, that was the whole. That was fun doing the tree thing. Um, we have a ladybug invasion in our house, as you've seen on this very pen gas. Um, it was. I don't know what it is. Ladybugs like our house. We've called exterminators to just be like. We're not trying to kill them necessarily. They don't cause any harm per se, except they freak our kids out because they like go into their bedrooms and stuff. Um, for whatever reason, just the last couple of days, it's it's been like an invasion. I mean, I'm talking hundreds of ladybugs, like all coming in through our front door in the early afternoon. Uh, apparently ladybugs, they like find a place to nest some random place and they send out crazy pheromones that are just like tell all the ladybugs like, hey, why don't you come just crawl around in here and get all up and everything? <laughs> like, I don't know what they're doing. There's no food that they can eat. Like, why are they all crawling through the seals on our front door? So it's like, it's something like out of a horror movie where I'm like walking and there's like ladybugs like creeping in through the cracks of our front door. It's quite disgusting. So we're trying to deal with that. And everything I look at of like ladybug traps, like how do you like freaking get rid of ladybugs? Everything is like, ladybug attractants because everybody wants to like attract them to their gardens and stuff they're really good for that but we don't freaking have a garden like I, how do i propel these dang ladybugs they're just very confused. yeah i like, i was gonna buy some last year but i couldn't <laughs> find some to buy because i needed some for my garden just come to um, my house man i'll give you a i would yeah I'll i know that like would a five have a gallon but... bucket full of ladybugs they're just they're everywhere <laughs> i can't I, I didn't buy them because they said <sighs> You should not buy ladybugs because A, they're taken from their natural habitat, and B, in order to actually do their job for your garden, they need to be from your local environment. So I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm not doing that. I mean, we're local Um, enough. Like, their natural environment right now is in my foyer. Like, what, (laughs) what, what good is that doing anybody? Like, let's be real. It sounds like you need to plant a garden in your foyer. We put mums. We bought some mums for the front for the front porch because apparently they don't like mums. We were sticking like bay leaves. Like literally, we're trying like every like hack that you can think of to repel ladybugs. I'm sure there will be some additional ones in the comment section. I'll let you none know. None of it's none of it's working. The only we had we had an exterminator come out a couple of years ago because they they love my son's bedroom window. So like every night in the fall, basically he has ladybugs that. Uh, you know, he's, we've got like a small little like hand vacuum that we call bug jail because like, <laughs> look, when it, look, when all this, for, look, I'm not like, I don't take pleasure in killing bugs, especially ones that are helpful and cute and stuff like that, like ladybugs. But like, it gets to a point where you're like, okay, when there are like 10 ladybugs every night in your kid's room and you're trying to like get it onto a piece of paper and then get it outside. And it's like, you can only do that for so long. When it's years of that every night for like months, you gets really old really quick. So now yeah. it's to the point where I'm like, no, you keep the bug jail in your room. And when it's there, you suck it up. Like that's what we've trained our kids to do. So I don't feel great about that, but also they're just going to crawl around and then die in our light fixtures. Like what else am I going to do? Mm-hmm. So I'll try to like suck them up and then let them go outside, but then they'll just come right back in. So I, don't, I really don't know what to do. Anyway. I can attest. I, I was in a meeting with Brian <laughs> earlier this week, and uh, not only did I see the 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 wall just riddled with these dots, but uh, while uh, we were conducting the meeting, he muted himself and uh, initiated bug jail uh, yeah. protocol. I, did. <laughs> I had to. It was getting out of control, and like my kids were about to come up from school, and like they're gonna freak out, and it's gonna be a whole thing. Anyway. So that's enough about bug jail. So ladybug invasion, if y'all are ladybug experts and you know how to safely or not at this point, I don't care. Just how do I get these things not to be in my home and like crawling around? Look, there's this one right here. He's been chilling here this whole time. He's right right there, right there. Anyway. Um, And then the other thing, (laughs) which may get some (laughs) some comments. I added this in journal. I'm not sure you saw it. So I I watched Bridgerton on uh, on Netflix. Not Mm -hmm. my typical like mo of a show that i would watch on my own but you know at this point like i've watched i've watched i think the first 17 seasons of gray's anatomy i've watched all of private practice you know just the stuff that i like being with rachel even you know we work together and work together all the time but i like being with her in our downtime so she loves these shonda rhimes you know shows and obviously i've heard the acclaim of bridgerton and it's you know not family friendly um but uh you know 
significant other friendly possibly um but uh you know i watched it and i was like okay but it was, it was really well made like i actually enjoyed the uh, the storyline and stuff like that so um and apparently they're making another season so i was like all right rachel when the next season comes out we'll like don't just watch the whole thing because she'd already seen it all the way through and she wanted to watch it again so she was like why don't we watch it together and i was like yeah all right i'll do that you know so anyway i can now say i've watched the entire first season of bridgerton and i did not hate it so there you go we've also ringing watched, endorsement we've watched all of sex in the city i don't know i'm not just like one of these dudes it's like oh, i don't watch that stuff i'm like no if it's like a really well-made show yeah i'll watch it it's freaking entertaining um yeah it was pretty good it was not as like bridgerton was not as raunchy as i thought it would be i thought it was it was, it was quite quite respectful and proper um but very, that very nice balance of raunch and respect. Yeah. Have you seen it, Drew? Have you, do you know what I'm <laughs> no, talking about? No, no. Yeah, Actually, I think it? that uh, I think okay. Shannon started watching it but couldn't get into it. We just finished uh, the last season, the last episode of Kim's Convenience, which was kind of a letdown. It was like a really random yeah, we finished that series too. finale. We're like some like well, they didn't oh, know all this. They didn't they, know what? it was going to be a finale. It, got can- it was one of those shows that got yeah. canceled before they could really yeah, wrap it up. It, yeah. it was really unsatisfying, which is kind of a bummer. But you yeah, know, that is yeah, unfortunate. Whatever. Yeah. I'm just going to have to go watch uh, Shang-Chi now and imagine that that's just uh, the follow-up sequel where one of them became a superhero. There you go. That works. Uh, so that's what I've had going on in my life. A lot, a lot, a lot of things, as well as work. Um, okay, so for company updates, I don't have a whole ton. You know, we're just doing our thing. Holiday season is sort of kicked off-ish. Um, we did have Fountain Pen Day, which we talked about in the pencast last week. Um, it was much more chill day for us, you know, historically it's been a time for crazy sales and all that kind of stuff. I think less of that was just happening all around because everybody's kind of in the same boat that we are just, you know, tired, understaffed, you know, just not trying to make a lot of crazy things happen on the retail front at least. Um, so, you know, I think that was fine. I think there's plenty to celebrate around fountain pen usage. That's not just like buy stuff on sale. Um, so we, you know went easy on the the kind of promotion of that this year um but it was kind of cool because it was the 10th anniversary of fountain pen day um so you know in future years i'm sure we'll do we'll kind of lean into it a little bit more but we took it easier which you know now in retrospect has made it for a much smoother week for us staffing wise and and so we have no regrets in terms of just internally what that allowed for us to do so we're feeling good approaching the holiday season with not as much trepidation, you know, but usually fountain pen day like kicks off craziness. It takes us a full week to kind of catch up and then we're kind of dizzy and then Thanksgiving hits and then we're kind of like five weeks of just getting spun around in circles. So we're trying to keep it a little smoother this year and it's working so far. All right. Next thing we got is what's on your desk. Drew, what kind of pen stuff are you playing around with right now? Uh, I've been playing around with the Pilot Explorer again. I know this was one of <laughs> our uh, one of our pen of the week segments in the pencast, and I'm glad it was Brian because I did a video, just a video overview for the Explorer that'll be uh, um, getting on YouTube soon, and I think that my experience using it for a week before we talked about it was really good, and it allowed me to you know inject some uh, some um, opinions of which I felt strongly about, and at this point, Brian, I am all in on the Explorer. I uh, grabbed a Metropolitan as well, did a little bit of a comparison, and I will say, this is better than the Metropolitan. A better starter pen, better recommendation for anybody choosing a Pilot $20 pen. Explorer is the way to go. I'm saying it, I will defend it. That's how I feel, I think better, and I'm glad. Better might be a subjective term, but um, I can see your argument. I think that the Explorer is, uh, greatly underrepresented. I think it, it punches way above its uh, its fighting class, if you will, its weight class. Um, so I don't disagree with your praise for the Explorer. Whether it should unseat the Metro as the go-to, I think is highly up for debate. The Metro is just so established and it's- It is, it is, but it needs to be unestablished. Needs to be Whoa. dethroned. Whoa. Needs to be knocked off that pedestal, man. All right, so that's some fighting words right there. I don't know that's... if I quite agree as much as that. I think both can live in harmony. I think uh-huh. I don't think they have to battle mm. each other. I think they can they can coexist, is what I'm saying. Well, I, I think that uh, here's the problem. I think that the thing keeping the explorer from elevating to its rightful place is the Metropolitan. And if it's in the way, it needs to go down. 
Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I, That's uh, the way it's got to be. I see how it is for you. You just, uh, you see the world in very black and white, apparently. Um, no room for Not black no, and white. No room right for Right and wrong. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> that's a that that's that's a quote from Clear and Present Danger. Ignore me. I'm sure it's a good. Is that a, is that an 80s movie? When was that movie? Was that early 90s? That Probably been, early 90s. Probably yeah. Early 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Because that one came after Patriot Games, which I think was also 90s. Okay. Even I don't know. I think I think Hunt for Red October was probably 90s too. They were probably all 90s. Hunt for Red October, I think, was ooh, it was right on the cusp there. L- yeah. Late 80s, early 90s. Oh, this is gonna bother me. Yeah, I think that that was. I think it was pre Beetlejuice. 1990. 1990. 1990. Was it was right on the October. cusp. Good call. Right Good on call. the cusp. When in 1990? I got to find out. Let's see. All right, Wikipedia, help us out here. This is what happens when you're an hour and a half in the pencast. You just. March <laughs> 2nd, 1990. Literally, so like. Very much on the cusp. Two months into 1990. Yep. Okay. Fair enough. Wow, thirty million dollar awesome. budget drew for Hunt for Red October. That like, yeah. that's like, Sean Con- Sean Connery eating soup doesn't come cheap. No, thirty million dollars is like not even the like marketing budget for a movie. Oh yeah, today. that's true. Like it's well, so, I mean the whole thing was on a submarine, so you can it was pretty much all one little set. Location budget probably wasn't crazy. Maybe not. I don't know. Man, Sean Connery, that man can rock a beard. Yes, he can. A good looking man. Rest in peace. All right. <laughs> For me personally, how do we talk about this? We we're talking about things on our desk. Yeah, what's on your desk? Okay. Wow. I just like completely forgot what we were talking about. Um, so I, uh, I've been in like a super rotten explosion. Apparently, I had the the Miyabi, and then we got in the Mother of Pearls, the Regattas, and then when I picked those up because I I went into the office this week, I also got the um, Abalone. Oh my God. Abalone Knights. Which Jeez, dude. It's not new, but, you know, and then so I was like, man, I kind of have like an abalone thing. You're going uh, full balloon. I'm full balloon. That's right. Well, this this one's not technically full balloon, you know, Any, but I, I get what you're saying. So I was like, yeah. So I, uh, I've been, I've been digging the, digging the balloon lately. Dang. Uh, yeah. So I've definitely been enjoying that. Um, Baloney so, burger. Yeah. I haven't inked up the, uh, the balloon nights. The the Conklin, um, that was one of my potentials. If I can't if I can't find my studio, maybe I'll link that one up. Um, but anyway, so uh, beautiful. Anything with Rodden, I just can't can't get away from it. The abalone. When does it become Rodden though? Uh, okay, so I think Rodden technically is the technique where it's uh, you know abalone shell in Urushi lacquer. So I don't think that this technically would be considered Rodden. Um, so that's the incorrect term. My apologies, but uh, it's uh, abalone shell. Um, and it's like, okay, so being real, the, the abalone shell on this one, like you can see that there's like different segments in there. It's not continuous pieces and all that kind of stuff. So you're dealing with more like, I'll call it scraps, right? So it's a much less expensive pen than some of these other ones that have all this abalone. But, um, you know, in the regatta, the reason that one works so well is because the pen is already segmented. So you can have continuous pieces in there. Uh, pretty easily because you're working with much shorter segments where it gets really expensive because it's a natural material is getting the really big long pieces like the green ray m1000 to get a huge long straight you know clear piece of abalone shell like that is very difficult to do they have to you know this is like the the kobe beef of abalone shell right like it's a very exclusive you know uh, mollusk <laughs> that produces a shell such as this exclusive um, mollusk that's right you heard it you heard it here first or as alone Ra- beef or as rachel and i would say you heard me bucko <laughs> that's a, is that a thing i don't know my parents used to say that to me when i was a kid <laughs> and so rachel and i say that to each other randomly and it's kind of funny like if one of us is like doubting something, like really, you want to do that? And like, you heard me, Bucko. <laughs> it's just like Bucko. Like who says that? I don't know. It's kind of funny. That's, so, yeah, I, I feel that. like I need to hear one of you say that to each other now. <laughs> It'll come out at some point. Um, and then the other thing, um, Drew, you've played around with these a little bit, but 
Um, we kind of alluded to like testing out some greeting cards. Yeah, I mentioned that last week. Yeah, they were on my desk last week. Now they're on your desk. They are indeed. I think we probably missed the window for like holiday greeting cards this year. Not that these are necessarily holiday themed. Um, these are from Original Crown Mill, so it's got yeah. Mine's um, a birthday card. Yeah, so we got like a couple different card options here and really we just wanted to like test them out with some different inks different uh pens and stuff like that see what the writing experience is like um so honestly the designs themselves come secondary to what the writing experience is and kind of the overall presentation so i don't have anything to present yet because i just brought them home and i have not actually like written on them yet but drew you said you've had a good experience with them so far yeah yeah i feel it made my um Twisby 1.1 a little skippy, you know, where it does that mm. like double line thing. Really? Okay. Um, I th I think just because they're they're very very coded. Yeah. Um, they're, yeah. They're, so, but but all the other pens worked really well on them. There was no feathering. Um, okay. And they they dried in, in a reasonable amount of time. So I, I I have not a lot of complaints. I just think that it's not paper. It's very it's it's, it's like rigid card. card. Yeah. yeah it's so it, it so it's gonna feel different than paper for sure. And it yeah. you know. Super polished nibs might be a little uh, little more um, prone to skipping on them, but yeah, yeah, overall, I was happy with them. I mean, my experience has been I'll buy, you know, like a bulk pack of cards at like Target or something like that, and it's pretty much hit or miss as to whether it's going to work with a fountain pen. Yeah. So I will buy like a bulk pack because they are cheaper per card, and if they happen to work, I'll buy like five packs you know and that'll be the cards i'll use for a couple of years um so it is difficult to find really good cards because again like you said you either get a card stock that's like super absorbent you know like newsprint toilet paper type absorbent um it's just really thick paper uh or you get something like you said that's so heavily coated that it's almost like writing on photo paper and the ink just smears like crazy it never dries and beads up and skips like crazy so trying to find a good balance is really really tough now this one actually does cards it, this one dried nicely the i use private reserve naples blue here and that one's smearing okay. a little bit but that one's got a lot of that one's actually got some sheen to it um yeah so uh I think if you use a middle of the road ink, you should be fine. But okay, yeah, that's the tough you gotta, thing. Yeah, you you do your research, and we'll we'll see. But okay. uh, right. yeah, greeting cards have always been uh, something we have not been able to pin down. So yeah, and then trying to get it at any kind of a reasonable price too is also tough because if it's a really good card, it might be really expensive, and then it's like nobody wants it. So it's it's tough. We've had a really tough time finding good ones that kind of meet everybody's needs. But anyway, we'll play around with those and kind of see. But uh, we'll probably look for something that's a little more non any specific holiday themes but uh or have some we could have something like a birthday because that could be any time of year but i don't know that we'll go like valentine's you know uh you know christmas like that like that single day of the year kind of holiday themed um, but we could maybe go with something a little more broader universal we'll see no promises but if you are interested let us know in the comments because we never know how much to pursue these things but if y'all are like beating down our doors to get it we'll pursue it more aggressively all right, that's what we got for the PenCast this week. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Please leave us your feedback about any of the various topics we talked about. Let us know what questions you have, because we will answer them, even if they are ridiculous. Um, we may put them into a quick rapid-fire session like we did today. Be sure to check out goodlaypens.com for all of your fountain pen, ink, and paper needs. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, wherever you happen to see us. You can email us at pencast at gulepens.com, especially if you're listening to the audio version of this. And my random fun fact, I'm thinking about Thanksgiving because that is coming up for all of us U.S. celebrateurs. Um, Drew, I already, I already shared this with you, but we'll, we'll share this with our audience here. So since Thanksgiving isn't far away, and a popular part of the holiday generally includes eating turkey, thought it'd be fun to have a nice turkey fact. So apparently Americans eat around 75 million turkeys for Thanksgiving each year, um, or around 690 million pounds of turkey meat, which is a equivalent to the weight of the entire population of Singapore. So like the human population of Singapore. I think that's I wasn't much. paying attention when you said that. I heard you talking about Ben Franklin, but then this one passed me by. My God, that's a lot of turkey. Well, my, my Ben Franklin turkey fact was this morning. This is what I shared yesterday. But Oh, geez. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Americans eat the equivalent of the population of Singapore in turkeys for Thanksgiving every year. That sounds somewhat cannibalistic put that way. 
but we're not we're not eating people. It's just the weight is associated. I know. To give I know. You my mind went there of, though. <laughs> I'm unhappy with myself now. Way to end on a dark note. I mean, we're eating birds. No one's listening now. I'm surprised. Yeah, I, I would be surprised if like anybody, because <laughs> most people probably turn this off when you start mentioning, you know, the YouTube channel and the subscription, and everything. That's like what that. I have to wonder. Okay, so if you have listened this far, Ooh. you have to comment something about the turkeys and the weight of the population. No, no, no. no. Give them a code word. Give a, a code, code word? word? What should the code yeah. word be? I don't know. Okay, I feel like turkey something. Going with your naming convention, Drew. Turkey you're, hammock. You're too, turkey hammock. Okay, so write turkey hammock with some other kind of nonsense in the comments. Give no context about where turkey no. hammock comes from. And then Drew and I will know that you are the most loyal PenCast listeners slash viewers because you stuck through all the way to the end. Past or you the, have somehow fall or you have somehow fallen and cannot reach your device to turn it off, which either way, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. We had fun today and right on. <laughs>